So I'm going to walk through exactly what happens here with a dynamic delta hedge using John Hole's example. And the situation is that you can imagine you're the market maker and you are writing or selling 100,000 call options, let's say to me. And that means you are exposed to price risk. Specifically, if the stock price increases, you're going to incur a loss on these call options that you've written to me. So you hedge that risk out by purchasing shares. The only difference is that you're going to rebalance every week. That's the meaning of dynamic. As the option delta changes, you're going to rebalance your portfolio to maintain delta neutrality or neutralized exposure with respect to delta. So I have here a replication of John Hole's Table 19.2 in this sheet. The next sheet in the workbook is his Table 19.3. So that's with my calculations and my values do match what he displays. And so you can see exactly how this dynamic delta hedge operates. And the situation we have here is you can imagine you're the market maker and you have written, that is to say you have sold, 100,000 call options, let's say to me as the counterparty. You've written or sold call options. It's 100,000. An option contract is for 100 options. So we can also think of this as writing 1,000 call option contracts. But you have price exposure, so you want to dynamically delta hedge. In order to do that, it's critical that we understand the definition of option delta I've already covered this in my previous video in this playlist, so you want to go back to that first, make sure you understand Delta, but let's quickly just recap the intuition of this. And let's just say that you've written only 100 options. Let's say 100 options, call options that you've written, where the per option Delta is right here, 0.522. So I'm just going to say Greek Delta of the call is 0.522. You have written 100 call options. What does this mean? That means you're exposed to a price increase in the stock, are you not? Right? I hold the option. It's a call option. If the stock price goes up by a dollar, it's gaining in value for me and losing in value for you as the option seller or writer. And the 0.522 is telling us that if the change in the stock price equals plus $1, then with a delta of 0.522, we're ex expecting a change in the call value to be minus, in this case for you as the writer, of 52 cents per option. That's how we interpret it. 0.522, uh, 52.2 cents per $1. You're the option writer. If the stock price goes up by a dollar, that is in terms of the option position, a gain for me of about 52 cents and a loss for you of 52 cents, right, on a mark-to-market basis. So if it's 100 options, then you are losing $52.20, just like I am gaining $52.20. So that's the purpose of the, uh, the Greek that is option delta, first partial derivative, it's the sensitivity of the call value with respect to a change in the stock price. Not the only risk factor for the option, but along with volatility and maturity, one of the top three exposures that you have. Okay, so, but in John Hull's example here, we have written, or you, let's say you're the market maker, have written 100,000 call options with a strike price of $50. We're assuming 20% uh, volatility, why would we use that? Well, that would be to price them. So I'm going to pay you. It turns out John Hull explains that the, or tells us that the Black Shoals price would be, value of all that would be $240,000. So you would collect the option premium on writing me those options. And then you incur the risk that the stock price will go up. We have risk-free rate of 5%. And we're going to do a dynamic delta hedge on a weekly basis. That's a choice that we make. We're going to rebalance weekly, so I have 52 periods per year, and it's going to be on a non-dividend paying stock. So here's the table that shows the dynamic delta hedge starting at week zero. And what I don't show here going down is we go for 20 weeks because these are uh, call options with a 20-week maturity. And so this initial term here 
is 0.3846, and that's in years. So that's because when, when you first write me these 100,000 options, the remaining term to maturity or the remaining term is going to be 20 weeks divided by 52 weeks in the year. That's 0.3846 years. Write all the inputs into the black shoals are really in per annum terms, and then they, they get adjusted in the formula. And so this just happens to be here, the stock, this is the stock price column. This simulates stock price, right? Obviously, at the time that you write me the options, you don't know what's going to happen. So this is just one, we can think of this as one trial and a simulation that Hull happens to show. And 19.3 is, is the different uh, trial. The only difference here is in the first trial here, these option, the options ends up in the money. So I'm going to exercise them. And the next one, they end up out of the money. So they're going to expire worthless for me as the as the holder or long position in these options. So I have here uh, D1. This column is not in the actual table, so I'm just I'm just showing it here. I, I think I it could be easily collapsed. So I explained the previous video, right? That's the key input into the uh, option delta calculation, and and there also is an intuition that I discussed in the previous video. If you want the intuition, but our option delta here is just a, a straightforward function of the D1. It's norm S dist, right? So this is, it's really just N of D1 on a call option. That's the standard normal cumulative distribution function, meaning that this is a probability function. So these have the characteristics of a probability for the call option. It's gonna, it's gonna the option delta needs to lie between zero and one. And technically, just so we're, uh, we're comprehensive here for a call option delta. The it's really N of D one uh, haircutted by E raised to the negative uh, dividend times maturity. So that dividend yield uh, does haircut that in the exponent. But for non-dividend, this value is one. So oftentimes that's why you just see N of D one because we assume a, a, a non-dividend paying stock. Stock. Okay, so. You've written the 100,000 options. They have a per option delta of 0.522. That's per option. Also technically called percentage delta can be confusing because the options are strictly speaking unitless. And now the first step in the dynamic delta hedge because what's the situation? Well, you have written 100,000 options and that's the quantity. I'm going to use a minus sign to, to show that you have written them to me. And they have a per option delta of 0.522. That equals 52,200. And I'm going to use a negative because you've written them. And that is your position delta. You have a position delta of negative 52,200. This quantity times per option delta has a very straightforward interpretation. It means that if the stock price goes up by $1, you expect to lose $52,200 on these written options. But I'm going to stress the approximately equals to, just to be mindful of the fact that the option delta is a uh, first partial derivative, so it is a linear approximation. The larger that move in the stock price, the less accurate will this approximation be? Okay, but you want to hedge this exposure to price risk that you have. What do you do? You purchase shares. Shares by definition have a delta of 1.0, right? Stock price goes up by a dollar. You gain in the, in the share position by a dollar in a one-to-one -one correspondence. The shares have an option, have, an, have a delta of one. So how do you hedge this delta exposure? You simply purchase 52,000 shares. That way, stock price goes up by a dollar. That's your loss on the options that you've written. But this is your offsetting gain on the stock. And it goes the other direction as well. Stock price goes down by a dollar. This would be your gain on the option position, and this would be your loss on the stock. You are neutralized or perfectly hedged with respect to the assumptions um, for that exposure to the risk factor here of the stock price, which is captured by delta. 
To purchase the 52,200 shares, you incur a cost of 2.5 million approximately. That's just based on purchasing that many shares at this price, 52.2 times the price for a cost of 2.5 million. I'm going to be I'm going to just round and our cumulative cost starts at that value. The final column here is the interest cost. And what we're going to do is we're going to just be charged interest for the purchases on our stock at the 5%, but this is weekly. So it's the co- uh, at the end of the first week, it's the 265 that we needed to fund the purchase multiplied by the 5%, but that's per annum, so we divide by 52. Get a weekly interest rate. Why are we doing that? Because it's correct in finance to always assume a funding cost. If we don't have the cash, we need to borrow it. Even if we have the cash, there's an opportunity cost to using it for this purpose. So it's correct in general to be explicit about the funding cost, even if it's an opportunity. Okay, so that's great. We are Delta hedged. And then we move to the next week. And then um, I really only need to show you one week to show you what we're doing with the dynamic Delta hedge. And so what's changing here? Well, the only two things that are changing are time is marching on. And that is significant for these options. That's the time decay matured in theta, um, captured in theta. But so as these options, uh, as the maturity shortens, as time goes by, the option delta is changing. And in fact, as it get as we get to closer to expiration, it's going to tend to one or zero, depending on whether in or, in or out of the money. So that's one change. But the more um, significant one for us here is captured by the simulation. This just happens to be a tr- one trial among whatever. I'm using John Hole's numbers, but they just as could easily be random. The stock price is changing. So as covered in the previous video, right, uh, delta is not constant with respect to the stock price. For this call option here, it's an increasing function of the stock price. So in this first step, it happens to be that the stock price drops from 49 to 48.12. The call option delta is going to drop, right? So dynamically, that's the most important thing that's going on here in the simulation. The stock price is changing, so the option delta is changing. So our option delta here, because it drops, goes down to 0.458. In the second week, stock price drops, it happens to stop, drop. Option delta goes down. And then in the third week, For the first time in the simulation here, the stock price goes up and you can see the delta goes from 0.4 to almost 0.6, an increase in the delta. Well, we want a net position that's neutralized or hedged perfectly with respect to this delta. So in that first week here, we purchased 52,200 shares, but but now we go into the, or week zero, when we go into the first, into the first week, beginning of the second week, I'm not sure how to say that. The option delta, the per option delta here drops to 0.458. We have written, or you have written to me, 100,000 options, but now the option delta is 0.458. I'm going to use the negative because you've written them from your perspective. And so the position delta is has drops from 52,200 to negative uh or 45,800, uh, or uh, drops, so to speak, from negative 52,200 to negative uh, 45,800. 45, so your position delta changes now. So you don't need to actually own 52,200 shares anymore. In a sense, you're overhedged now. You can sell some of them. You can sell the difference. If you sell 6,400 shares from the 52,200 that you owned, you will will have remaining 45,800 shares and you'll be back to perfectly delta hedged or delta neutralized. Back to a situation where any gain or loss in your option position is offset by a gain or loss in your share position. And so that's really... That's really all that's happening here with the dynamic delta hedge. Now we go to the next week, stock price and simulation drops again. 
down to point four. We don't need as many shares. We can share, we can sell another, or you can sell another 5,800 shares so that I know, uh, I can see your share position will be 40,000. So you can look at any one of these now. I don't even need to do the math here to see that um, in this, very, there's a very dramatic drop here from a price of 53 to uh, 49.88. And uh, there's a large share sale, which will bring us to a held share position of 55,000 shares. I can just read that here, knowing that this is solved for based on the perfect delta hedge. Okay, so that's the basic dynamic. We get down to the bottom here of John Holes as the options approach maturity. And as mentioned, this first sheet says a scenario where the stock price ends up above the strike price. That strike price is $50. Happens to be that in his scenario here, we end up with a stock price of 57.25. Remember, you've written me the options, so they're in the money I'm going to exercise. And that option delta, as it approaches um, expiration here, is tending towards 1.0. And your cumulative cost for this dynamic delta hedge is 5.263 million. So that sounds fairly high, except that um, I exercise the options are in the money. So you're paying me that uh, on that strike price here, you're paying me 7.25 million. However, you own here cumulatively on the quantity here. It doesn't show here, but cumulatively you own 100,000 options at the the $50 that you do collect, and that's $5 million. So you have $5 million worth of stock here. Your cumulative cost was $5.263 million, such that your cumulative cost here is $263,000 at the end of the 20 weeks, and that matches John Hull's number. Okay, so I'll go back up. Keep that in mind. At the end of 20 weeks, the cumulative cost for you to dynamically delta hedge this was 263000 What we don't show here is when you first wrote me the options, you did collect that premium. John Holt tells us that you that premium was approximately $240,000. It's based on pricing those options with a Black-Scholes model and volatility assumption of 20%. You collect $224,000. $240,000. You then go the 20 weeks dynamically delta hedging your price risk away. So from that perspective, really hedging out all your risk at a cost of future value, $263,000. So his point there is if you take that to present value, they equalize. If you think about it, that makes some logical sense. You, uh, it should, it, if you want to take that premium and then incur that cost to hedge out all the risk and be risk-free position, there shouldn't be any profit for you. The kicker on that, or the assumption there, is that this simulation reflects a realized volatility of 20%. I haven't checked that, I but it's John Hall. I'm sure it's right. So this does equal out if the realized volatility equals the implied volatility at the time you price the options, right? Obviously, if this pricing reflects them, uh, it must reflect implied volatility. It it will probably under or overstate the actual real realized volatility, and then there will be a profit or loss. That's the key assumption there. And then, so I won't go through the second sheet in this uh, uh, nineteen point three, but you can see same dynamic. The only difference here is we get to the end of the, end of the twenty weeks, and the stock price ends up out of the money so that you've written me the options i have i have no uh nothing to exercise they're worthless um your cumulative cost now is the is the is 256 so it's similar only difference here is delta went to zero options expire worthlessly so that's the dynamic delta hedge and uh, if that video is helpful, please subscribe to the channel so you'll get notified of our updates. Thank you.